Yeah, thanks, Candice. I'm very excited to be having everybody here. And thanks, everyone, for taking time another day to join us. It'll be certainly an informative, uh, you know, probably 40, 50 minutes. Uh, happy to keep it interactive. Feel free to ask questions in the question and answer uh, box, and we'll try to get to it. So talking about modernizing image security and CICD uh, with Cosign and OPA, if you're unfamiliar with what those are, you'll be much more familiar with what they are uh, after this webinar. So uh, next slide, please, one. So really quickly, who you know, who are these faces that are talking to you? Uh, I'm Ravi. I'm a product manager here at Harness, uh, but my background has been in distributed systems. Uh, I've been you know getting items wrong and right in production all the time. And as the older I get, the more if I my future works the first time after I tried it, it means it's probably wrong. And also joined today with my partner in crime, Dewan. Maybe Dewan, a quick uh, second about yourself. Yeah, sure thing. I'm Dewan Ahmed. I'm joining from the beautiful east coast of uh, Canada. I work at uh, IBM and Canada for eight, uh, Red Hat for eight years, and then a European database startup for two years before joining Harness. And I've been fortunate to be part of the CNCF uh, and cloud native ecosystem for quite some time. So I really benefit from these awesome projects and looking forward to discuss some of those projects today during the webinar. Back at you, Ravid. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Uh you hear me say next slide a couple of times. I like Dewan and I were talking like right before like the, the webinar started. It would be awesome to have like a cloud native or Linux foundation type of way of like two people controlling the slide, but unfortunately you hear me say it a couple more times. So what are we gonna be talking about today? So kind of like just um raking over like what exactly is like CI C D and like why is security important in that? So continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, as an increased attack vector, like why is it even why is it important these days? Then we're going to start getting to some of the more nuanced pieces. So such as cont container image security, like, you know, for example, how do you go about signing a container? Uh, we'll tell you how to do that uh, in this webinar. But then also, uh, well, what do you do with that information, right? When something is signed, uh, you probably want to have some sort of security posture, security policy uh, to kind of go through your pipeline. So we'll show you how to set it up also. And then boating into that uh, kind of overarching of that is like actually supply chain security. So what does that mean? And then we get into a demo. We'll show you how all this is possible. Uh, and then if you have Q&A, you can ask you know, throughout. Like we're not, Dewan and I are pretty cool. So you're not, like, kind of, you ask asking anytime, like you have a question. So uh, go ahead and feel free. And then, uh, yeah, we'll hopefully uh, be informative for the next 40, 50 minutes. Um, so Dewan, next slide, please. So what is CICD? Okay, so I try to boil it down as like simply as possible. You might've heard these terms, continuous integration, continuous delivery. You might say them together, like CICD, like an epidem, like they mean like one thing, but Kind of at the end of the day, uh, your CI/CD, or well, it could be one or multiple pipelines. Um, your build and deployment pipelines are your main conduit to your end user, right? But a couple of things here. Usually, you know, you you have source code that you want to be able to deploy, but in that particular process, right? Like, you know, your machine doesn't understand, you know, source code or like in, like uh, code in plain words. It has to be compiled or put in distribution. And that usually has to be placed somewhere in a piece of infrastructure. And then that usually needs to be deployed. Uh, to get in the hands of end users. So basically your CICD pipeline is your conduit to your users. Um, it's a place for iteration. So if you take a look at years gone by, like you know, 10 years ago, people might deploy it maybe like once every six months. Today, your CICD pipelines are being executed all the time. You might not be going to prod every day, but you're certainly deploying to a lower environment, maybe like dev or a perf environment. And even uh, software is iterative support, right? I'm again, going back to my first joke, Never got something right the first time. That's very true. Software's trial and error, so you have to be executing this over and over again. I'm the one. Next slide, please. And so, kind of the evolution of CI/CD, right? So, if you're unfamiliar with what CI/CD is, here's a quick evolution. You probably used some of these technologies before, or all of these technologies for like the one and I at some point of our careers. And so, uh, getting, let's say, your idea of, let's say, back in the going from left to right, you know, your deployment process should be very bespoke, right? You might be deploying via a shell script or might be building a very specific like image, like an RPM or a TAR or like you're using, you know, it's like an AMI, right? And how you go about getting that off of your machine or off of a central spot to another spot is like a shell script, but it's very bespoke. It's like, it's your shell script, your infrastructure, probably a lot of your libraries. And if we're going towards like the middle now, right? So we're looking at like, how do we go about getting this more automated? You might have some sort of like automation program, right? So that might be, if you're familiar with Jenkins, right? It's like, okay, we have a generic piece of automation that will run a piece of workload for us. And then if we start looking at what's going on today, right? You're like your CI CD, even the infrastructure that it runs on starts looking similar because of the rise of ephemeral workloads or the rise of container orchestrator or container orchestration or containers like Kubernetes or pick your orchestrator of days gone by or days, days looking forward. 
Um, we're like in this cloud native phase. So even the infrastructure that's running it is probably Kubernetes based. Um, you know, it kind of like stands up and it gets destroyed. Builds are very CPU intense. And so you're looking at a very, uh, very elastic level of workload. And especially also the workload you're deploying has to go somewhere that might be Kubernetes today. And so kind of because things are done by a convention and other ephemeral, uh, that actually increases the attack service. Uh, Dewan, next slide, please. And so why is there a larger attack or service area? So going back to like the day of like shell, right? Or, or like or bash, um, it's your infrastructure. It's your version of Linux. You know, you're running something very, you know, like to your organization you're running and the particular hardware might be, you know, your, your hardware spec. It might be, uh, you know, the, your flavor of Linux. It's controlled by your IT organization or your build and release organization. And that, but you have more control. Like you can do pretty much anything you want, right? You, you know, you can, <laughs> you can get to the kernel level, like if you wanted to and do whatever you want. It kind of moving to today, right? There's less control, but there's more convention what's going on. So, uh, you, Kubernetes, Docker, you know, your pipeline itself, you know, like if you take a look at an open source project today, there's usually some sort of like build YAML or build manifest or even a deployment YAML or manifest. Like an example up in the apps that I write, I have a couple flavors of deployment uh, manifest in my applications in the repository, right? Um, even low level infrastructure like compute and storage or networking and storage are done via software configuration. Like, you know, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, uh, CNI, CSI, right? Like those interfaces are all are all common. But what that means is that because there's a common attack vector or there's people are leveraging common infrastructure, that means that your infrastructure, your build infrastructure also becomes uh, kind of a, an area of attack. So as your teams are building more or less convention-based, so we're not gonna talk about too much of the infra, you know, like, hey, like your CICD, like the things that power it are under attack. We'll talk a little bit more about the workloads that you're building on it. And also how do you secure those workloads? Cause those same principles can also apply to the infra. And so as we go through the presentation, just remember like, hey, as, as you embrace containerization, as you embrace instead of velocity, um, also so do people who have nefarious means, right? Like, hey, they are able to make a container do. Uh, they're able to, you know, understand, oh, if you look at very, very large scale of out of breaches that happened recently, you know, they they might not have been on the networking stack. They were on the application stack, right? You can look at the struts or log4j, or I can like rattle a few off of my, my hand here. How do we start, you know, a let's, building a more secure uh, supply chain. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Dewan and Dewan, maybe take us over a few of these technologies that are helping helping folks become uh, more secure. Thanks, Ravi. So segue from the CI CD that Ravi mentioned, right? So the build, pushing image and deploy, this is sort of the abstraction, which doesn't matter how mature your pipeline is, that's sort of the fundamental. But let's zoom in a bit. So if you zoom in, you'll see that each of these stages, right, it has a lot of different pieces. For example, within your build stage, you can run dependency check, you can run some static analysis, and this is sort of where you're doing white uh, box testing. You have access to the application code. You can run secret detection. Then you build the artifact, OCI artifact, uh, you push the image. And then during the deploy phase, you're doing sort of a black box testing. Uh, that, that's where you're on uh, DST or DAS analysis. You don't have access to the source code, but you're running other sort of tests. So that's what we mean by CICD security, that having security all the way in, in the pipeline from your deployment, uh, from your development all the way up to the deployment. When you have access to the source code and when you don't see uh, uh, to your source code, like, like a white uh, box testing. There's also policy and compliance because different industries and the size of your companies might mean that your application uh, will touch different pieces uh, of the vertical. And that's where compliance comes into play. So all those different pieces uh, are important for your CI CD pipeline. But today, will not focus on all of these. We'll focus specifically on container image security. And that is because 87% of images that run in production uh, have critical or high vulnerability. That is based on a 2023 cloud native security and usage report. Now, what we mean by container image security, 
there are various aspects. So let's break it down into five different pieces. The first one is the image integrity and trust. There are challenges in ensuring the authenticity and the integrity of your container images. There are risks associated with pulling the images from untrusted registries, or let's say the image is outdated, which might have known vulnerabilities. Number two is there might be some configurations issues and hardening issues. Um, there might be uh, configuring containers or for the orchestration platform, something like Kubernetes, and you need to have hardening for that specific environment. You need to implement the least privileged principles. Next, you can think about dependency management. This is where you manage and secure the web of application dependencies for your containers. You need to keep all the components up to date to mitigate the risk of vulnerabilities, both for your application, but also for dozens of libraries and packages it relies on. Many of us can relate to accidentally checking in an AWS IAM key uh, or some other sort of sensitive information and something like Git Guardian saves the day. So you need to ensure I get that those alerts a little bit too many times, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> go on. Yeah, yeah, like um, I've seen a lot of tweets uh, for, for Git Guardian that thank you for, for saving my job. Um, so, so we really appreciate tools like that that protects um, people's jobs. So we need to ensure that uh, such API keys or credentials are not embedded in, in container images. And last but not the least, you need to think about the whole life cycle and compliance management. You need to oversee the full container life cycle from development all the way when you're retiring a container image. This all following the security policies and regulations. So we understand that container image security is important, but what to do about it? Well, to get started, you might want to minimize the supply chain risk uh, and save time by using trusted container images. And that's one of the things we'll focus on throughout um, the talk today and also show in the demo. You need to put vulnerabilities that are uh, in use during runtime at the top of your list. You also need to ensure that the image doesn't get bloated too much. That means if there's too many unnecessary components in your container image, it's very difficult to identify where is the risk. Number two is reducing granted permissions. That means putting the extra effort to manage permissions, only grant permissions that are needed and remove both permissions and users not being used to reduce an attacker's opinion option for initial access to your container or the, the environment where the container is running on, or maybe accidental credential access or privilege escalation. Number three is regularly tuning your detection rules based on the threat intelligence for your own system. And that is the black box testing we were mentioning previously. Now, this brings us to this image that looks like some sort of envelope with a wax seal. Uh, Ravi, yeah. what do you think when you see this image? Yeah, so like you know, if you way, way back when, when people would send packages and very elaborate, you know, seals on them, um, having a wax seal is like a, like a temper thing, right? Like the seal is like broken or it's chipped, you're like, hmm, did someone open this package? Or, you know, if you're, I'm not saying I used to do this as a kid, or maybe I did, but like, you know, you're trying to intercept you know, the report card where your parents get it, you try to like open the envelope and seal it right back to, you know, change that C to a B. I, no, 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 I didn't do it. Maybe I did do that, but same same thing, right? Like what, what, what container image signing is trying to do is trying to prevent like man in the middle attack or kid in the middle attack like me getting a report card uh, early. Uh, and it's imagine like GPG uh, for containers, right? So beautiful picture here. Like it, this is exactly, if you're unfamiliar what container image signing is, it's making sure that, hey, what what the original contents, what are there have not been tampered with in terms of supply chain security. So I'll pay, give it back to the one. Yeah, that, that is a great uh, insight, Ravi. And and not not that this meeting is recorded or anything, so we can definitely <laughs> Don't mention, much, about, mention about peeking, peeking through the, our report cards. 
So yeah, relating this this angle of two container image signing, right? If we do do a comparison, you can think this letter representing the container image that contains your application code. The envelope for this letter represents the different container layers that package your application. The personal wax seal you see there that represents the digital signature of your container image, and the unique imprint. So this my sign, right? So that that unique imprint represents the signing key that you use to sign your image. Don't worry if you don't know about the the uh, different ways we sign the image. We'll cover that uh, in, in a bit. And when you send this envelope, right? When the recipient recognizes that this is a seal from my friend, and I trust that, and I see there is nothing broken, uh, it, it hasn't been opened before, so I can trust this and I can open it. So that process is the image verification process. So it, it helps sometimes that everyday thing we see uh, are can be can be uh, can be uh, traced back to how we build, package, and and deploy software. So let's look at this image for a second, but container image signing. So how it works is, and uh, Ravi and I were chatting with Fusion engineers about uh, what's their view on, on container image signing. And, and rightfully so, there were, some of them haven't heard about it. Some of them were thinking that, do we even need that? Ravi, like they were mentioning, right? Like, what mm -hmm. is image signing? Like, I'm doing that my work and I never have to worry about that. Yeah, yeah, it's like we, you know, internally we sign our images here, it's like a harness, but it was kind of like transparent to them. It's like we are signing them, or like there's like some sort of like chain of custody that's going on. It's like ah, uh, yes, you know, there, there are stuff going on. So it's um, it was interesting to kind of like we were actually actually right before this webinar I was asking, hey, like who you know who understands that you're using it incorrectly or not, and kind of like where you know it, it kind of comes in is like during the pipeline policy they'll say oh like maybe our signing service didn't kick off because we got booted out of the, you know, our deployment space. But that's getting ahead of, ahead of ourselves or getting at least ahead of ourselves in the beginning. But yeah, the one like, good, yeah. Good job there. Yeah, so as, as a developer, you might not understand about container image signing or you might not see it in your day-to-day -day life. And that is by design. Because let's say the process of creating a signed and trusted image looks something like this. So the architect of the project they might pull a public base image. And from this image, they might do a vulnerability scanning, and then they might clean up unnecessary components from that image. Now, the image by that time is a lot lean because it, it doesn't have those, those bloated components. Then for your specific project and company, the architect might install required libraries and software. Then the image might be configured and security, security tested. And finally, that image might be signed with your company's uh, key, uh, private key. And the image is pushed as the new base image, new signed base image that is trusted. So this is sort of the process that goes uh, underneath, it's sort of transparent to, to uh, developers. Now, when we talk about container image signing, just like a few, few uh, challenges we have uh, in the software industry is having too many options. Lack of options is typically never the case. So similar to that, we have a lot of options around container image signing. So how do you choose the right tool? All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll discuss some of the tools, but due to the time we have, it's not possible to go in depth about all these tools. So after I finish um, discussing these tools, my colleague will add a link in the chat from a 2022 uh, six store uh, talk, six store con talk. So there um, the speaker goes more in depth about these tools. So let's quickly go over these tools. So Docker Content Trust and Notary V1 are used interchangeably, but actually Docker Content Trust started uh, from Docker used the Notary V1 architecture, um, Docker Contents Trust, started uh, at 2015, which uses the update framework. Now, it has some issues with signature portability and storage. It has an API server and a database besides the registry. It established a solid foundation in image signing, so we learned a lot from this. But because it lacks some enhanced security features, uh, you probably will not use it right now. 
The next one is Grafeus project that was introduced by Google around 2017. Um, it offers comprehensive solution for the software development life cycle. It's not only for container image signing. For example, it does a whole lot more how different events on how you sign the image, but the burden falls on the verification. So now it's not a Boolean signed versus not signed. So whoever is verifying the image has to go through all those processes to, to, to get the result but it doesn't provide a mechanism for public key dis discovery. Um, it's better suited for uh, first party integrations. For example, if you're using GKE, but uh, if you want to, your customers to use it, uh, uh, let's say you have an image in public and your customers will be pulling that image, Graphius probably is not something you'll be using. Next comes Notary V2. So that's the evolution. Uh, uh, from Notary V1, uh, it got improvements in signature portability, uh, integration with third-party key management solutions. It supports signing via X509 PKI. Uh, however, to the best of my knowledge, as of yet, it doesn't provide, uh, provide a CA or certificate authority. So this leaves public key discovery for open source image verification uh, a bit challenging. So we did mention that Notary V1 is based on the update framework. So as the name suggests, the update framework is a framework and it's not a tool. It's designed to enhance the security uh, to update software system or security for software update systems. Uh, it's a CNCF graduated project. It focuses on the resilience against key compromises and attacks um, and uh, it's not an image signing tool per se, like other tools we have in the slide, but other tools are, some of the other tools are based on this framework. Now that brings us to last, but not the least, which is Cosign. So in this context, Cosign is from the Six Store project. Uh, it offers a compelling solution. It's simplicity, the registry compatibility, and the effective link between the image and the signature provides a user-friendly approach. That is the integration of Falsio for uh, certificate management and Wrecker for secure logging. Uh, this really got Cosign's uh, popularity in, in the ecosystem. Now, how you sign the image, more important than that is how you verify the image signature, right? So the cosine strength lies in its verification process, which is important for CI/CD pipelines. So it integrates with policy engines like Open Policy Agent or OPA, and it provides both keyless and key-based signing. So to learn more about that, uh, check out the, the Six Store Con 2022 uh, video uh, you probably will see in the chat. So I mentioned about key-based and keyless signing. So let's talk about three aspects. So the first one is the principle. So key-based signing uses a static pair of cryptographic keys. So one, a private key that you use for signing, and then let's say the other one is a public key that others are using for verification. Now, keyless signing relies on dynamic, dynamically generated short-lived certificates, and that doesn't need uh, for you to store uh, private keys and public keys permanently. The, the next concept is around security. So key-based signing uh, security relies on the protection of private key, how you can protect those private keys. So if the private key is compromised, then that produces significant risk. That risk is significantly reduced on keyless signing because that depends on ephemeral certificates. And then let's say your OIDC providers uh, are generating those certificates. Fine, final concept is around the use case. So the key-based signing is well suited for environments with established key management infrastructure, and you can secure uh, the, the storage of those keys in long term. But let's say keyless signing might be more ideal for open source projects or organizations who don't want the burden of key management. Each method, keyless or, or key-based, offers uh, distinct advantages. 
I'll quickly give some examples. Let's say key based examples would be GPGPGP um, or X509 certificates. And, and keyless uh, examples would be six stores for show for, for short leap certificates or the transparency logs uh, like record. Um, Ravi, what do you think about policy? Like I think of insurance policy, but what do you think about policy? Yeah, yeah. I also think of an insurance policy, right? Or, or, or that's what motor, automobile insurance policy. Yeah, kind of like what what is a policy, right? It's like it, it's policies like tough, you know, like or tough framework. It, it's a it, the the academic definition of a policy. It's it's like it, it's things you can do and things you can't do, right? Like it's like hey, it's a framework that hey, given a certain um certain action, what is a certain what what do you expect to be the outcome? Like for example. Uh, if, you know, if, if I'm going over the speed limit, I can expect an outcome to be, I get a ticket, right? Like that's a, a policy. Well, it could be law depending where you live, but that's usually like a policy or, you know, an organization, like a, a good organizational policy, like, like kind of foreshadowing is like, Hey, you know what? Usually if there's some sort of business control, when you're trying to deploy a policy might be that the author of the application can't be the deployer. Some people still do that. So that's the policy, right? Like, hey, how can you enforce that? And so like, given a certain action, what is the expected reaction or outcome um, is a policy? Perfect. That, that is exactly it. Policy is just a rule. And as Ravi was mentioning, I don't know if you saw my slide or not, Ravi, exact to the same example. <laughs> for example, <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> for example, like the deployments to fraud uh, should go through an approval stage, right? So that brings us to policy governance or, or policy as code. So nowadays everything is code. We have pipeline as code, we have infrastructure as code. Why not policy as code? So it's the, it's the process of managing and implementing policy definitions through source code rather than this. So what is this? This is our very favorite shell script. I can't think of a single organization that doesn't maintain and nurture a, a huge army of shell scripts. So this is a shell script and this is the equivalent of policy. So what happens in a shell script is, uh, first of all, it's imperative and then it's very difficult to maintain. But then in, 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 a, in a policy, when you have policy as codes, it's much cleaner to read and something like open policy agent. This is a general purpose policy engine. So you can use one tool to ensure policy across your entire organization. Of course, when we talk about open policy agent, uh, we'll show an example today in the demo. So Harness itself uses policy as code uh, that's based on OPA or Open Policy Agent. And within Harness, we have OPA server. Uh, that's an OPA server that's managed by Harness. If you haven't used OPA before, I highly encourage you to, to take a look at Open Policy Agent that's uh, based on a policy as a language called Rego. Uh, it's sort of a, like a debate like YAML. Is YAML a language? Is, is Markdown a language? So Ravi, is, is Rego a language? I feel so. It's a syntax or a DSL. You know, I'll give I'll give a credit, Rego or Rego <laughs> credit. So yeah. I, I I agree. Like as someone who transitioned from writing enterprise Java code. Uh, I like writing Markdown and YAML. So, so definitely, so these are these are languages. All right. So how would you combine policy as code with, with uh, container image signing? So imagine that developer, right? That for them, it's transparent if the image is signed or not, or what is even container image signing? So once our architect creates that signed base image, the developer, now trying to deploy uh, a code to Kubernetes environment, first they're trying to use something like an unsigned public base image, and the policy checks and then it prevents, it denies the image deployment. But if they use a signed public base image, the policy checks, how it does this, which we're gonna show, see in the demo today, but that image is approved and then they can, they can deploy that image. So for, for the developer, uh, there's very little friction, and that's what we want to do, uh, whether it's a sysadmin or whether it's a DevOps team or architect. You want to lower friction for developers. You want to enforce security and policy, but not too much friction for your engineering teams. 
All right, so our favorite demo time. So I'll, I'll switch from this screen and I'll go to the demo. So I'll, first I'll, I'll, I'll explain a bit what we uh, will see in the demo. So in the demo, uh, we'll see that, so this is a typical Kubernetes deployment. I'm, I'm using a harness platform as an example. So we have a pipeline here. Pipeline is a top level concept at harness and each pipeline can have more than one stage. So for example, we have one stage here, guestbook deploy stage, and each stage can have more than one step. So at its simplicity, we can have just one step, which is let's say we'll do a basic Kubernetes rollout deployment. And without any guardrails in place, without image verification in place, pretend that these two steps doesn't exist. Your engineer can just deploy the image, right? but we'll see how we can sign an image and then verify the image. So first we'll see it manually, and then we'll see the automated action. For that, I'll go to my terminal. So hope you can see my terminal. And here I'll sign an image. So before I sign an image, so let me show you where this image is coming from. If you'd like to follow the entire tutorial, my colleague will link this in, in the chat. There is a tutorial that goes in depth about what we're doing. There's a video if you want to, to uh, watch this video. But basically, there's a public image uh, for, for the popular guestbook app. So I pulled that image and then tagged this image into two of versions. It's the same image. So I'm basically taking the same image saying that one image is the dev uh, edition and the other image is the prod edition. And this, these two images I'll sign. So let's do that right now. So first I'll sign the dev version of the image and I'll explain you what I'm, do, what I'm doing. So this is Cosign, which is one of the tool of the C Explorer project. And I'm using the Cosign sign command followed by the image. And if you see, I'm using actually the image digest, which is more preferable over using the, the tag, which might be latest, but you don't know what, which latest it is. So that's why, uh, let me copy this one more time. So I'm using a keyless signing. You can use both key-based approach, but in this case, I'm using keyless signing. Because I didn't provide a key, the default option is keyless signing. At the very end, you'll see a flag dash A. So this is an annotation. I can just provide any key value pair here. I'm saying the env equals dev, and you'll see why I'm doing that because I'll add a policy at the end for this. Next is asking me that this is the six store service and it's generating ephemeral keys and it will use the YTC provider to verify. I hit Y for yes. And then it pops open this page, the OAuth uh, link for six store.dev and it gives me some options. How I want to authenticate. I'll choose GitHub as the YTC provider. Once I click that, it shows that my six store authentication is successful. So this is where I'm signing the image. Let's say I come back to my terminal. It says successfully verified. It created an index and it pushes the signature to the Docker Hub, my image registry. So let's go to Docker Hub. So this is my Docker Hub and this is my guestbook dev image repository. You'll see that I have the image, which is 0 0.1. So this is my image tag, but there's something else. If you see a few seconds ago, there's a new tag. Now this ends with dot sig. So this is the actual signature that was generated based on the signing we just did. And I can do one more for the prod image. So because I signed my dev image, Let's now sign the prod image. The same command, cosine sign, followed by your image, 
at use the image digest rather than the image tag. And then you can add the dash if for any annotation for key build, key value here. So once I do that, the same, same uh, opening of the, the six stores uh, YDC page, and I'll use again GitHub. And then it will val validate. And I can check uh, now in my Docker Hub guestbook prod repository. And you'll see a few seconds ago, this signature was generated for the 0 0.1. Now, one thing I'll quickly show, because I tagged these two images from the same image, the image SHA, so if you see the image SHA for this image, which is the guestbook prod, ends at 9975. And if I go back to my dev image, let's say go to 0 0.1, the image SHA, 9975. So these two image SHAs are same. This is a demo, but for your case, they will not be same. Let's say for your dev environment, if you generate an image and you deploy something to prod, those image SHA might be different. So now that we sign this image, let's now do the verification. We're not to verification in CI CD yet. Let's do the verification manually first. So I'll use the cosine verify command and I'll explain all the different pieces of this command. Let me clear off the screen. Ravi, is the font okay or should I zoom in a bit? No, it's good, I can see it. No okay, problem. perfect. So the command is cosine verify followed by the image. And this time I'm actually using the image uh, tag 0 0.1. Now there are two flags. One is the certificate identity. This is my email and followed by the certificate authority. So OIDC, OIDC issuer. So in this case, uh, I'm using GitHub, but you can use Hotmail um, or, or GitLab, uh, and those would have different OIDC issuer. The tutorial, uh, my colleague linked in the chat lists all those different issuers. So let's see the response of this command. Um, gibberish, very difficult to understand what we're seeing, but we can make it better. Let's pipe it to JQ. All right, so this is more human readable. Okay, so let's let's go through this. So this response has two parts. The first part says that your verification for this image uh, is done. The cosine claims are uh, validated. And the existence of the claims in the transparency log. We're not covering transparency log in this talk. But then the second part is actually a JSON part, which has a critical uh, part and an optional part. So within critical, it shows that the identity, it shows this is where the image is coming from, the actual image uh, repository and, and the image digest. And you can see how you can, you can parse these different parts of this, this response to enforce policy. That's exactly what we'll do. So now that we, we see how we can do it manually, let's automate that. So I'll now switch to the CI-CD pipeline. So here, my pipeline guestbook deploy stage has three steps. Before I actually deploy my image, I added two steps. One step to verify the image. So this is the cosine verify step. So this is a shell script step, and I'll zoom in a bit, and I'll explain what we're doing in this step. The first is in the CI CD environment, I'm installing the tool, the cosine tool. So these are the first three lines. The line number five, that gets the response from the cosine verify command. So in this command, I'm running the command here, the command we ran, right, cosine verify, for the guestbook dev image, I'm running that. And then I'm parsing different pieces of the output. Next, the output variables are limited to this particular step, but I want to use it in the next step. And that's where I use something called script output variables. And I'm mapping each script output variable to the output variable. The next step I have is the policy enforcement. So before I add this step, I'll show you the policies first. So I have 
two policies. One is to check the environment and the other is to check the image digest. So let's go forward in the check environment policy. If you have used Open Policy Agent, it should be very familiar, but even if you haven't used Open Policy Agent before, uh, this should make sense. Um, similar to uh, any programming language, you have a package, so there's a package main, and I have a deny policy. Uh, if the input environment, input.env is not dev. And we have a handy tool called Ada within Harness Platform. So let's say if you need any help, uh, you can ask generate uh, policy to allow uh, or to, to deny uh, deployment to any environment except that. Right, let's see. So Ada will actually generate policies for you and you can fine tune how, how you want these policies. All right, so let's look at the next policy. Next is the check image digest. A very similar concept, we have a deny. If the input digest doesn't match this. So I already showed you before the image digest ending at 9975. So both the dev image and the prod image would have this. So now I go to my pipeline and I'll run this pipeline. Remember, because I'm using the dev image, all these two policies should pass because the image digest matches and the environment matches. I'll go ahead and run this pipeline. It's checking the infrastructure, the resource constraint, and the cosine verify step is running. If you see here, I'm getting the output. Uh, it went very fast. Um, and then the policy enforcement step passed as well, and the rollout deployment already started. While the rollout deployment taking place, I'll open this policy and you see that each policy has to be part of a policy set. It shows how both policy checks uh, were, were passed and if I want to show you a negative case, I'll quickly edit the pipeline and go here. Within the cosine verify, of course, in an actual pipeline, you'll have this as an environment variable so that the actual manifest for your application and also the check uh, comes from some sort of template, but I'll cheat and I'll, I'll do hard code right here. So let's say the dev image, I change it to fraud. Let's do that. And then I'll click apply changes, I'll hit save, and I'll hit run one more time. Let's run this pipeline. So this time the image digest policy should pass because it's still the same image digest. However, the environment policy, check environment policy should not pass. So let's see. All right, so we see here, the image digest is a success, but the check environment, let's dive in a bit, you see that this one failed, the check environment, and it even shows you that you said any environment, input.env, if it's not dev, I'm gonna fail. And then the response that comes uh, from, the, from this um, um, first step says, says that the env is fraud. So this is how we can combine a tool like Cosign for verifying image signature and a general purpose policy engine like Open Policy Agent. But Harness has uh, software supply chain assurance, SSCA, that has fine tuner support for, for signing and verifying signatures with, with Cosign. And my colleague will add a link in the chat. Um, so I know there is a ton of information um, to, to consume in such short time, but there are two links. Uh, for resources. One is a tutorial where there's hands-on instructions and also there's a blog. If you want, you can scan the QR code or type in the link. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, my colleague will also add a link to a Harness Community Slack where we're more than happy to answer your questions. Ravi, I'm going to pass it back to you to see sure. any questions in the chat or anything you want to add no, I think that was uh, it was very very informative and thanks. Yeah, going through 
going through that demo, you and I learned a few things about, you know, signatures uh, in, uh, in in this webinar. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't really see any, any questions on there. Also, you, for the folks who are watching this or watching it live, like those two particular links right there are the best for those in the chat. I'll just send them out really quickly. I send out the tutorial one. I'll send out the blog one um, super quickly. I was looking for it. Um, let's see. And I'll add the software supply chain uh, blog as well. Let's see. I just had it open. So if there are no questions, one question that I had is, if my company has private registries and everything is more like internal, why do we need to worry about uh, image signing, right? And, and the answer to that is the whole link of your software, software to supply chain, you just need one weak link to cause havoc. So for example, if your software developer is building code and then pushing an image and then someone is using that image, it, it really doesn't matter whether you're using a public registry or a private registry. If you use something like container image signing, it reduces the risk of your entire software supply chain because you just need one weak link to add vulnerability to your software that your end customers are using. So I think that's one of the one of the reasons that that large uh, corporations, even if they have things behind firewall within their own private network, they still use. Um, the the practice of signing their container images and then verifying it. Well, we have one we have one question. We can answer that. So, um, member asked, uh, for example, during our deny deny case or the failure case, uh, the the payload output can be kind of uh, verbose. And it's hard to see why there's a denial. Um, so how OP I'll take that one. So how OPA works? It's like OPA is usually on on a protocol, right? Like on HTTP or TCP, it's like it's you it's you're getting the request information. And yes, like in the request will be more information that you need when like OP, o, o, OPA or Rego like parses it down. And so but the rule should be uh the, the rule would be is correct. Like hey if you understand how the rule was set up, um, you'll understand how the deny is. And also from a platform engineering standpoint, like you know your the rules will be kind of like set by let's say a central team. And you know you'll be able to look out for for the output um, of or the condition that caused that that rule to fail. And so understood, yes, like the payload you're getting more information than than probably you would need. But also it's like the backing proof, right? Like, hey, this is the request or the payload information would cause it. Uh, but good question. Great, thanks, thanks for the question. And uh, yeah, look us up on on LinkedIn and Twitter. We, we do appreciate if you connect uh, us on those platforms. And if you have further questions, feel free to ask us there. I think if you don't have any more questions, it's uh, time to pass it back to Candice. Thank you so much, Dewan and Ravi, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.